Welcome everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. My name is Nancy Gert. I'm president of the Valley Women's Club. I want to welcome you to the Candidates Forum for the 5th District County Supervisor. And we have our candidates here tonight. Um, this event is sponsored by the Valley Women's Club, the League of Women Voters, and Community TV of Santa Cruz County. So thank you to all those that were involved in pulling this uh, forum together. I'd also like to give special thanks to the San Lorenzo Valley High School government AP classes. We have 12 students here tonight. Um, could you raise your hands? There. <laughs> And they are students of um, Steve Safranco, Cindy Martinez, and I believe there was a lot of coordination done by um, the counselor here, Leslie Burns. So thank you to the teachers and the counselors. <laughs> And I'd like to thank the candidates for coming out tonight. Um, we have Eric Hammer, and Bruce McPherson, and Bill Smallman. And it's, um, they put a lot of effort into their campaigns, and we really appreciate you joining us tonight. <laughs> So finally, I really want to thank Ann Wise from League of Women Voters for graciously um, um, accepting the job of being the moderator tonight. And um, with this, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to her and she will explain the process and um, then we can begin. Ann? Thank you, Nancy. I'm really proud to be here representing the League of Women Voters, and I'm so glad you came out to the forum tonight. The League is very interested in having informed voters, and so that's why we do these kinds of things. We have a kind of strict procedure that we follow, and we will do that tonight. Each candidate gets an opportunity to make an opening statement. Then we will do questions from the audience and our students have been diligent. We have a big pile up here. So uh, thank you for asking your questions. If you think of something during the uh, program, write it down, wave it. The students will come and get it. And then at the end, we'll have a closing statement. The candidates have drawn for their position in speaking for their opening statement. And number one is Bill Smallman. Uh, oh, thank you. A uh, big reason why I decided to vote is I, r I really believe that the wrong candidates are getting elected and I suppose I could sit home like Peter Finch and just say I'm, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore but or I could decide to run so that's what I'm doing that's why I'm here. And do we really need any more proof than the state of California is really in the worst condition that it's ever been in and to elect somebody that's been part of that failed management team I believe is wrong. Um, and oftentimes you hear candidates uh, express that there's going to be a change and oftentimes you do not see a change or you see a change in the wrong direction. So I believe that if voters really want a change, we need, really need to change that the way that we vote. Um, do the 49ers, when they're looking for a quarterback, do they look to, uh, uh, at name and, uh, endor endorsements or name recognition? No, they don't. They look exactly how that player is going to help that team. Same thing goes with a company that wants to hire a CEO. Same thing needs to be applied with county supervisor. You're the boss. Use independent thinking. Don't listen to anybody else. You have our resumes in the form of brochures, newspaper articles, and websites. And this, in, this forum can act as an interview. Let's get started. Mr. McPherson has stated that he is the one that needs to get elected because he's the only one that has contacts in Sacramento. But in reality, everybody in Sacramento is very easily accessible. 
And if Eric or myself have the good fortune to be serve as your supervisor, we could easily establish contacts with a simple phone call or email. Secondly, he has also stated that he will uh, hit the ground running by overseeing the realignment plan. And the realignment plan is simply a failure of the state government in managing prison populations. Both Mr. McPherson and both Mr. Hammer's resumes are severely lacking on specific tasks or goals. And basically, they, are the, they provide the list of issues that we are obviously all in favor of. What I have to offer is I believe I have a unique work experience and qualification to help with serious issues involved with the planning department, environmental health service, this department and also infrastructure upgrades. I'm a civil engineer, I'm educated in the sciences, and I have over 23 years building infrastructure improvement projects. I'm also the only candidate that has listed the specific tasks to create a board of economic development. And I've been often asked, well, how can you support economic development and be an environmentalist at the same time? I have to be clear that I only support economic development that doesn't increase the human footprint to a large degree. A good example of that is the Target that didn't get built in Scotts Valley, but moved it to the Capitola Mall, has less startup costs, and is most likely to do much better business down there anyway. But I have to say that we are part of the environment, and a healthy economy and a healthy environment need to partner up together. A healthy environment provides for our tourism industry, our fishing industry, and agriculture. And a healthy economy helps um, with um, providing the resources. We all know that there's a severe lack of people with work with county government that, has, does not, that do not have business experience, so I like to create a board that is entirely consisting of people that with that qualification, they can support expansion, growth of business, they can expand our vocational training, we can literally become the breeding ground for entrepreneurs in this county. And the most exciting thing that I, this board that I wanted to do is examine the way the county does its government and look at it as if it were a business. Bottom line, to serve um, the, uh, your tax dollar the most efficient way. It would have been very helpful when they were negotiating pensions. It, um, and the next thing, they will be on right on top of in, any infrastructure improvement projects that may be needed to help business in the county. And then finally, the last thing I'll just finish up is to make sure that, as you business owners out there know, to make sure that it takes very little effort to make the customer feel like the boss, and it goes a long way to establish a good relationship. Thank you. Hello, I'm, I'm Bruce McPherson, and thank you for being here and showing your interest in this race. It's a very important one. Uh, there are big changes going on in government, as we know it, and I want to be a part of it. Uh, I was, uh, I'm a fourth generation Santa Cruz native, uh, born in the fifth district, uh, went to public schools here, raised my family with my wife of 44 years, Mary. Uh, I wrote and worked at the uh, Santa Cruz Sentinel for 26 years. I wrote articles uh, about issues throughout Santa Cruz County, including every district in the county. I feel like I know it well, and for 10 years of those 26 that I was with the Sentinel, I was the editor and editorial writer that gave opinions on issues that uh, faced the valley at the time uh, and throughout the county. Uh, many of those had to do with water and sewage and so forth, and septic tanks, and we're still hearing those kind of problems still uh, as we move along. We still have to address those issues, and I think I'm the best one to to put myself forward to serve you and as your county supervisor in this great, great district that we have here in the fifth district. I have been fortunate enough to be, have been elected to the, uh, and I think that is fortunate to be, have been elected to the uh, state legislature for two terms in the California Assembly and two terms in the uh, California Senate and also served two years as California Secretary of State. And during that process, I saw, had a lot of experiences, of course. You take a couple thousand votes a year, uh, you see how the system works or how it doesn't work. But overall, through my procedures and in, when I was in the elected office that I held, I was, I was known as one who is a problem solver, 
one who is a consensus builder, and one who gets the job done. And I think probably no more clear evidence of that was when uh, then Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger nominated me to be Secretary of State of California when the previous secretary had to resign or chose to resign. And I was confirmed unanimously by every member of the Assembly and the Senate. And believe me, ladies and gentlemen, there are not too many unanimous votes in the Assembly and the Senate these days. Uh, I think that shows a respect that I earned uh, for the job that I did and working with people in the legislature. And I think it is important to know people in the legislature. And I think it's important to know how the state works. And aside, and as long as when I was working at the Sentinel and when I was in the legislature and for the last six years when I have not uh, been in the legislature, I have been uh, dedicated to public service, whether it's the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County, the Second Harvest Food Bank Chair, I was um, uh, the, uh, the uh, chair of, uh, or of, uh, a vice chair of a Cabrillo Scholarship Fundraising Organization where we raised over a million dollars to give to kids for scholarships. These things matter to me and I think they matter to you as well. I feel very good about the endorsements that I have received and I do think they count too. Uh, I have received the law enforcement, the sheriff, the sheriff uh, WOWACS endorsement and the preceding two sheriffs as well as uh, environmental leaders. Uh, uh, Jack O'Neill, uh, Renee Shepard, a very distinguished county planning commissioner today. And I think that it does matter. Uh, and I think that in this time of realignment, the knowledge that I have, the experience that I have, and the contacts that I know in the state and federal level of government are very critical to seeing that our, our county and our district gets its fair share of the resources that we deserve and we want. I can tell you that in, well, I've, been the, I've been walking precincts and I've really, I really am very pleased with the welcome re, uh, reception that I have gotten going door to door and I've gone to every place in this county, in this district I should say, and I really appreciate the warm reception that you have given me and I know I've gone to some places where others haven't gone because you've told me so. So I, I thank you very much for your, your being here and uh, Eric. Thanks, please. Thank you everybody for being here tonight. My name is Eric Hammer and I'm running for 5th District Supervisor. You might be asking yourself, why would anybody want to do that? Well, let me, let, because I love looking at everybody here. And there's actually some truth to that. I look out right now and the people in front of me are people that I've been working with my entire life. I look out here, I'm born and raised in Boulder Creek. I've lived here 43 years. I went to school in this high school. Uh, I represent this community very strongly. Um, so when I say that I've worked with a lot of you in this room, I really have, and I'll pick out some of you later on. Um, what got me passionate to run is I was raised in a family that honored civic commitment to the community. I was raised in a family where we walked the watersheds on the weekends, where we cleaned up the river, where we had... I was actually drugged to most of these as a kid, so let's this, this be honest. Um, and today I'm actually dragging my kids to the same thing. You know, we went to the river cleanup here uh, this last year. We filled up our truck. I've got three amazing kids. You know, they go to the school systems here. You know, I've got an amazing wife that's right here tonight that, that stands beside me. I'm a down-to-earth person here, but I also understand the significance of of, that we're facing right now. And I also understand the 5th District. We are three distinctly different communities within this district, and that's important. We're the San Lorenzo Valley. The San Lorenzo Valley has one voice in local government, and that voice is the supervisor. And that voice needs to be strong, and it needs to be heard with the problems that we have with economic development, environmental uh, impacts on our streams with water. We've got Scotts Valley, which is also unique in itself. It has a city council that helps govern it. But that city council needs to be able to work together in partnership with the supervisor. But the residents also have two voices. But they also have different needs. Growth is one of them. Business development in a different, different fashion. Yet, we also have some of the same similarities, and I'll get to those. Santa Cruz, also very distinctly different. They have a city council. They have concerns 
that our voice in a different way. And the way, when I've gone out and talked with people, they're concerned about high density building downtown in the SoCal corridor. We don't have the high density building, but we're concerned about growth. It's the same. They're concerned about the potholes outside their street and the parking along their curbs and gutters. We don't even know what curbs and gutters are or sidewalks are up here. <laughs> but it's the same issue. It's infrastructure and deteriorating infrastructure and how you're going to get it fixed. It's going to take a combination of working with all the local governments and all the organizations out there pulling together to be able to make that difference. I have the skill set to be able to do that. I am the only candidate that has 15 plus years of experience working through this building department. I'm a licensed general contractor. I specialize in removing red tags and doing remodel projects. I interact with the public and I interact with the county on a daily basis. You know, it's what feeds my kids. It's what feeds actually many members in this community. You know, my company employs directly and indirectly 100 to 200 people. You know, and I give back into this community from my company. But the point I'm take, making is I have the leadership and the understanding on how to make that impact. I am president of the Boulder Creek Business Association. I understand what it takes to bring a group of people together to promote business and tourism. I have sat and elected to the Boulder Creek Parks and Rec for the last eight years. We have made a significant difference in Boulder Creek through Boulder Creek Parks and Rec. We built a new park. That park was built by you people here. Not by me, but by you people here coming out and volunteering. And there's 15 or 20 people in the audience that I know I saw out there with shovels. I sat on the board of Mountain Community Resource Center and successfully worked with a group of hard, energetic, passionate people to help with a merger to keep the doors open forever is the intent because we got sustainability by merging with Community Bridges, which is a fantastic organization. That's the skill set that I bring. Not to mention the fact that I'm passionate about youth. We started the Teen Center and took it over from the Y back in 2000. The Y was going to step away. The funding wasn't there. A bunch of us in the community got together. We formed the 501c3. I was elected president by my peers, which was an amazing experience at the time. Jeff Almquist was on that. Barbara Springer was on that committee. My mom was on that committee. These are people that I've looked up to in leadership. So, thank you. Thank you very much to the candidates. Now we're moving to the question portion of it. And you folks in the audience have been very generous in asking <laughs> questions. <laughs> and. So I've been here, sitting here, trying to group them so that we don't ask the same question five times in a row. We're going to start off with a general question. The candidates each will have two minutes to um, answer the question. What issue do you feel most pressing in each of the three communities you will represent in the 5th District. How will you address this issue in each district if different? Bruce, you're first. Well, I think the, there's, um, okay, three issues. I think the economy is, is no question uh, that is really a concern for everyone. I've gone door to door and seen uh, many people, or uh, more than I want to, say that my house is going to be foreclosed upon in the next two weeks, uh, and I'm, I'm going to have to move and so forth. Uh, we, we have, as a county, we have to establish some kind of a, a government organization center, as Mr. Smallman had mentioned as well. Uh, this region, Santa Cruz County, is the only government in this region that does not have uh, a strategy or personnel to guide us and, and dedicate us to creating jobs and business opportunities here. And we have those here with our tourism industry as a basis, high technology, particularly in the Scotts Valley area. We need to do that, and that's really a critical thing. I think that protection of our natural resources is also a critical thing that people really look to and say, we need to, we, we like it here, this is why we like it, let's maintain it as best we can. And I, I agree with that. And I, I think that we, we really have to make sure that we 
maintain the natural resources, the natural beauty that we have that really drives the tourism industry in this area. Third, I think that we need to be sure that we provide adequate public safety and law enforcement and fire protection services from our, our really overworked and excellent sheriff's department and our, our outstanding volunteer fire departments that we have throughout the valley. Going along with that in, in uh, law enforcement public safety is the, the road system that is here and it's a very complicated uh, situation. I think this district has been shunned and put in the back seat of that for uh, that situation year in and year out. It's about time we get our fair share because I don't think this district has gotten it for several years running. And I think that's going to have a, a really significant aspect on the improvement of our fire protection and our police protection that we have in the 5th district. Question one more time. Please. What issues do you feel most pressing in each of the three communities you will represent in the fifth district, and how will you address this issue in each district if different? I think the I spent the time out in all three areas that we're talking about again: Scotts Valley, Santa Cruz, and the San Lorenzo Valley. And it's really difficult, I think, to take a look at any one impact that's hit them all. But my feeling is we're looking at renewable resources as being our number one long-term impact. Uh, the economic implications, I think, we're feeling the hardest right now. But I think what we're going to really be facing is water, sh water shortages and how we're going to manage growth or slow growth uh, based on the renewable resources. Um, Scotts Valley's aquifers are being drained. Um, they have been able to, through good water management uh, practices, been able to um, level it off, but they are definitely not increasing the aquifers. You're looking at Santa Cruz uh, with an expansion, possible expansion of UCSC and the possible uh, looking at a desal plant, you know, which is a huge issue. And that is the top of everybody's mind that I talk to in Santa Cruz. What is your opinion on the desal? You know, so I know that that is a huge issue. And in the San Lorenzo Valley here, you know, we have the watershed, but it's all surface water. You know, how do we work together to maintain a water source that's going to be there for eternity and that's going to take collaboration of a lot of very very smart people and they've started the process the problem is not everybody's working together yet and not everybody has the same goal we need to get to that point to where we all have the same goal and working on a strategic plan to implement it Okay. Um, yeah, I think I covered the econ economy is big in my campaign, and um, I talked about the creating board of economic development, and that that would be district wide for all three communities. Um, infrastructure improvements. Um, you know, it's been said that oh, we need to improve infrastructure roads for our tourism industry, but a lot of the roads are actually Caltrans maintained. So. Um, a lot of the roads that we're talking about are residential roads, especially in San Lorenzo Valley. And um, John Priestley has wanted to do a um, chip seal operation, which I agree with, but he wants to increase the sales tax to pay for it, which I don't, I don't agree with, and I think we should budget more money for that. And the reason why that's a priority is that it's a road maintenance, because roads, when they start to deteriorate, the subgrade starts to go, and eventually you end up with a road that, if you want it smooth again, you're going to have to rebuild the whole thing, so the cost goes up exponentially. So I really believe that that's kind of the first infrastructure improvement. And then also there's a lot of roads. We live by one that just got washed away on East Sayani Road that I believe, you know, those ones that got washed away, um, these need, they need to be fixed, you know, for fire protection and the inconvenience. Uh, I don't think we budget enough money for our roads. 
Um, secondly, there's a lot uh, less priority is water pollution. Uh, you know, a lot of people tell you the San Lorenzo River, if it was pristine, would promote a lot for our tourism and our and the fishing industry. There's a lot of we have a high density septic tank, so that and it, we could do a lot of water conservation methods to save water. Um, people can start using reclaimed water at their houses, etc. I mean, there's a whole host of storm, storm drain redesign, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I'm against. I'm publicly against the desalination plant. I believe that uh, we need to restrict growth. I'm against, I'm against sprawl and I believe that we need to spend a lot more time studying uh, infra uh, water conservation methods and, um, and all, the, all the essential service, police, fire, etc. They're essential and basically I, I don't, I, whatever they need, I believe that, they, that we need to support them 100%. Thank you. Now we're going to move to probably the most popular question. <laughs> I have a big stack all on the same subject. Our fifth district supervisor will probably serve on the Library Joint Powers Board. Would you support the 10 branch system and would you support exploring funding for construction of a new library in Felton? And we're gonna start with Eric. Yes to every one of those questions. Um, I'm very supportive of our public library system. Um, in fact, you know, my kid, I grew up sitting on the lap of Ann Gulliver during story time at Boulder Creek Library. That was a time that, for me, I w it was hard, you know, as a kid. And the program that these kids have during story time. I, I mean, I'm 43 years old. I remember the stories that Ann Gulliver told me. My kids today love it. Um, they look forward to going to the library and checking out books. I think it's imperative that we support the 10 branch system and the local libraries. I am excited that in this last week, the Felton Library has moved forward in small steps by being able to move the land over toward to the county and their vision of creating the footprint and building the, the, the building pad and then taking a look at bringing portables on um, or modulars to start out with. I think, I think that's fantastic. I definitely do not agree or think that the new library in Scotts Valley can serve our community and I will fight to make sure that our libraries stay here and stay local, that we don't have to look to go into Scotts Valley to serve our needs. Thank you. And first of all, I, I would like to congratulate Mr. Wiley and the people of the Santa Rosa Valley School District for what they did to rebuild the library here at this school. It's a tremendous asset and it's deserving for those students to have that kind of facility here. It is absolutely outstanding and you should be congratulated. As for the Felton Library, there he is right over there. As for the Felton Library, I was one who signed the ballot measure to extend the quarter cent sales tax for the library system indefinitely. It was, going, it was set to stop in, I think it was 2013 or 14. I was one of those who they asked to come to uh, sign that measure to put on the ballot in June of 2008 and it passed uh, overwhelmingly. Uh, secondly, after that had passed and the library board had gone back into talking about condensing this 10 library, 10 branch library system to say five or so, they asked me my opinion and I said, don't do that. Geographic location is absolutely essential and important. Keep the 10 libraries where they are and if you have to cut down some service time or hours, that's the way to do it, but do not close any branches. This library in Felton is, was designated as the top priority when people supported the library bond in the first place. How many times do we have to forget that? I'll tell you, if I, and I, if I become your county supervisor, I am going to be asking to get on that library board to have that library built in Felton tomorrow.
Um, I, I, I full, ditto that. I fully support the library. Um, my family uses it all the time. I grew up going to libraries. I think all counties and city made an early obligation to have libraries, um, and they kind of let that down. I'm not sure exactly the reason why. I think there's a lot of people think, oh, why do you need a library? You have a home and a computer, and, and, but it serves as a learning center, and there's people that can't afford to have a computer, or they just want I, me. I, I had I didn't have a computer when I was a kid, but I, you know, I liked getting out of the house and going to the library because it inspired. It was inspiring, but also it's just it's great. I love going to the Scotts Valley Library. I'm like uh, both these guys. I want the Felton Library built. Uh, we could have used that two million dollars they wasted on the Zion Oaks and built the darn thing. I want to build, and I if I get elected, I'm going to very be strong supporter that make sure that it gets built and not only gets built but also had may has a, a support uh, to stay open you know not get built and oh forget about it we want to keep it built but we also want to have quality people working there and, and also maintain it as well thanks <laughs> okay we're going to move a little bit uh, in our discussion, North County does not get its fair share of county money for just about everything, and a lack of a true local city government does not help. What will you do to ensure that North County will get its fair share? And Bill, you're first on this. Well, I, I, I want to make sure that they, they get their fair share. Um, there is, I know that there's some concerns because I know there's people that live just, you know, they live so far and they don't have as many people using the roads. Um, so the, and the, that's what kind of happens is that the, the roads that are close, you know, that, that gets the most traffic get the priority and then the ones that are in the, you know, way out there. So it's difficult, it's a challenge, but, um, you know, I, 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 I'm running this campaign. I, I, you know, I have no favoritism whatsoever. I don't care if you live in, I live in a very rural area, and, but obviously I, fa you know, I, I, I favor people that live in the urban environment in the Scotts Valley equally. Um, I, I'm, yeah, I'm blind, you know, I, I support, you know, if I realize that there is um, a deficiency uh, for the rural residents, residents in North County, you know, I would, I would like to address it because I, I mean, I live in a rural area and there's, there's some big issues, not only um, you know the roads, but also uh, fire protection as well, and it's difficult to get to those areas. So, um, and I think some partnership with um, CDF as well um, to make sure that they have uh, fire protection is very important to maintain, and also maintain the local um, fire districts in those areas. Thank you. Uh, the question again was the. Uh, the econ economy that did you say? That no, went, did you, that is North County. Now it's North County. You convince your other four supervisors, and you've got to get two of them to say you need your fair share, which you haven't been getting for years and years. And that's particularly true of the area from Felton on up in the valley. Scotts Valley and Santa Cruz, of course, are cities. Uh, they can take care of themselves. Uh, they are important to us. We need to cooperate in many, many ways in the tourism industry that has been mentioned by some of us as well. But there are things that we need to do to uh, in, encourage and really twist arms to get things done so we can get that Felton Library done. And I've been known to build consensus, as I mentioned, and to get things done. You, got, you need to identify the problem that you have, and it's clearly the library in Felton. Uh, do we need, how can we make a swimming hole be returned to Ben Lomond, which people want, and, and get that done? And you can do that and be economically sound in doing that and have a swimming hole for the summer that would be very valuable to the people of Ben Lomond. And then let's go to Brookdale. Let's work with the private sector at times, too, to see how we can clean up that mess, and that's what it is. And it, it takes a lot of work, and that's where you can start to bring in and work with the private sector to be part of the solution to have a growing business so you can provide more revenues to provide the services that every one of us needs. This valley has not gotten its fair share. It's pretty evident to me when I'm walking through the neighborhoods 
And I think we need to work with people. I know that I, I've done that in a legislative sense and a political sense before in the legislature. And I've been very successful at it. And I can be successful at it again for you. And I look forward to that opportunity on the County Board of Supervisors. Thank you. All right, this I think is one of the most important questions that's going to be asked tonight. It's the backbone of what's important to the San Lorenzo Valley. It's the services and making sure that we can provide the services and get the funding that the county already has. It's not about raising more funding within our own community. That has to happen also with the partnerships. But it's about getting our one-fifth share of the general fund and the services that are provided with those and fighting for those. You do that, yes. Mr. Fitzgerald is exactly right. You got to have two votes, but the way you get those two votes is to work with the community and petition and, and and lobby, be at those meetings, and show that we are committed and we need to do an audit of where the money is being spent, how it is being spent, and where it's not being spent. We need to take a look at fire service, Los Cumbres, the outer areas. So we need to more adequate fire protection. We need more law enforcement right here. We need to be taking a look at putting a satellite police station in Ben Lomond, more centrally located with more law enforcement up here. We don't have nearly enough health services. We have to go to Emmeline or Dominican for any health services. We need to find a way to pay to bring the services that everybody else in this county has within 10 minutes of their house up here. 45 minutes is way too long to wait for response. We don't have mutual aid, period. Scotts Valley, Santa Cruz, Pasa Tampio have mutual aid. They have law enforcement, they have fire, they have an ambulance there within 10 minutes to their house. We don't get that, we need that here. And the way you do that is getting everybody in this room empowered, working together, taking a look, putting on me as supervisor to take a look at the books, to find out where it's being spent, and then hold the other people at the county accountable and say we need our share, and then we make it happen. Thank you. Okay, another popular issue. There is a proposed safe route to school here along Highway 9. Will you energetically support this project? And there are a whole bunch of different variations off of that. Start something right. Yeah. I'm already supported. I've been working with People Power. Uh, and sustainable transportation and safe routes to school to identify, a, a route has actually already been identified, to make it safer for kids to come to school. You know, I've been endorsed by People Power because I think outside of the box. You know, I want to make it safer for kids. I want to make it a, a better form of transportation. It, it helps with, with gas, it helps with the danger of the roadways, it helps with the carbon footprint that we're worried about. The first part of this project, it's small. We've, if you take a look at the transportation study that's been done for the San Lorenzo Valley Corridor, it's huge. It's 47 pages long and a tons of millions of dollars to be able to implement it. What we're asking for right now is a very small piece. We're talking about trying to get from downtown Felton through the back street and improvements on Highway 9 from the high school here just to the road that cuts up just by A, a plus properties. Small piece. The second component of that is from the high school to, to Glen Arbor. We're not asking for a lot, but what it's going to take is people in this community stepping up and working together and forming partnerships so that we can rally to get the funding, take a look at alternative funds that are out there through state and federal programs, and get behind it. So do I back it? 100%. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I'm, I'm an avid bi bicycle rider. I grew up in Marin County, and uh, I, I ride bikes like crazy. I rode the first mountain bikes. Um, and I, I'm a, I, I totally advocate uh, safe bike paths. Um, I, I kind of, I don't really advocate widening um, some of the highways and making places for bikes because I still think it's pretty dangerous. So, I, you know, I w I'm not familiar with the exact routes of the, um, the bike path that um, 
that Eric was talking about, but I was looking at, um, on the, uh, it was on the east side of actually Highway 9 going through open space, but um, I absolutely support it. I think it's great. It's, it'll, it'll not only make a safe path for um, children, people, kids going to school, but it'll be loaded with, you know, guys my age riding, riding bikes. It'll be wonderful. Um, it will be expensive. I, you know, I know they were talking about putting a bike path on Roaring Camp Railroad, but I, I, just, I think that would be um, a little bit too expensive. But these these bike paths, absolutely. I, I, I'm supporting 100%. I, th I think it'd be a, a really, a really big improvement for this community to have that asset. Um, it's, I grew up with them where I, in Marin County. It's wonderful. They have a lot of bike paths that are off off the main road and you can literally go. Um, I went to school in Chico, I'll just talk a little bit longer since I have another minute. <laughs> but um, I, I literally, I didn't drive a car for uh, the whole year when I was up there. I, I would drive, I just took, rode the bike path all the way up Bidwell Park to go home and it was, it was just great. Um, so I support pe people power, but you know, some of these ro are really, to go through some sensitive uh, environmental areas. I, you know, the Arana Gulch was really almost like a road, not really a bike path. And I think we need to be concerned that we're not building big roads through um, open space areas like that. So I, uh, I was kind of questionable about the Arana Gulch project. So anyway, thank you. Yeah. Absolutely, I'd be supportive of that. And our, our children deserve no less that are going to school. I mean, this. Uh, uh, this traffic pattern, if that's what you want to call it, it's kind of a traffic uh, jam more than anything in school days. It is, it is absolutely horrendous. And I think we need to do everything we can to provide bike, bike trails and bike paths that are not on Highway 1 if we can. I understand that there's some people that want to do it for a commute, but I'm thinking more of the children that are going to school and what we need. For heaven's sakes, let's give them the basic safety that they can come and go from school on their bike and do it in a very safe manner. And we, they deserve no less, and I'd be 100% behind that. Okay, kind of along the same lines. From the town plans, many years ago, there was discussion of a bike and hike path along the way, all the way from Junction Park in Boulder Creek to San Lorenzo Park in Santa Cruz. What happened to that plan and designated funding? And Bill, I think we start with you. Well, I, I think a lot of these projects would be absolutely wonderful, but we have to, you know, we have to consider some cost involved um, um, and the priority. And like before, like we talked about the infrastructure improvement projects that we really need to focus our dollars in on some of that stuff. But a bike path from all the way from Boulder Creek to Santa Cruz, I'm there. I mean, I would love to have one. But again, I, you know, I want to stress the fact that, um, and I, I believe in my civil, uh, civil engineering and work experience is valuable with that, because it's very difficult to prioritize the types of projects that we really want. They may sound wonderful, and not like the Graham Hill Road Project, I don't, I don't disagree with it at all. It's a very safe. Um, it's going to help the uh, project there as well, but it had a high price tag when we have some other big infrastructure things that we should, the money should have been there. So, but, but bottom line, I support it, but we need to be concerned about the, the money. We need to prioritize the money and put it where we really need it. When we, ha when we do have the extra money to pay for these things, then we can divert, divert it to that. But. It, it would be absolutely wonderful, but I think we need to stick with these uh, bike paths for the schools. That, that's obviously the priority one, not these recreational ones that go all the way to Santa Cruz. Thank you. Now, uh, what happened to it? Uh, well, it, literally, it didn't get done, or it hasn't been getting done. So we have to see how we can make it, uh, make it happen. And it, it is uh, with the tight money that we have for transportation services throughout this county and throughout this district, it's a difficult task to take on. But I don't think that should stop us from saying, let's try it and let's, let's keep our eye on the ball and keep going after it. Because when I was in the state legislature and working with Fred Keeley and Sam Farr, we had a seashore trail. They said, oh, you'll never get it done. Well, that is getting done as I speak. And it takes time and it takes years. 
My suggestion to you is we have to know, or I would have to know as your supervisor, how important it is to you and be vocal about it so I and the other board members hear that this is a top priority for you. Because when I've been going to, throughout this district, door to door, I don't go to tell people what I think or what's on my mind. I'm here, I'm there, as I will be at the county board to hear what's on your mind and what are your top priorities. This, uh, we, we have all talked about the transportation network and how lacking in really services and really the, uh, the, uh, the, the priority that has been given over the years here. And, and usually when you talk about transportation, it is on vehicles. We need, that is going to be a top priority for uh, the Highway 9 corridor because it's a state highway and the T State Transportation Commission gives you the money and bike trails are not a priority there. So my suggestion is let's try to uh, do what we can outside of the state highway corridor to connect some of our communities, to connect, to connect them to some of our services. I think that's the best, motive, most immediate chance we have to really develop a bikeway system in Santa Cruz County in the 5th District. There was a lot of work that was actually done by several members in this community looking at the feasibility of the bike trail. Um, so it wasn't that it was dropped completely. It was that there were some huge roadblocks that were put in front. And I think it's important that people realize that there has been people in this community that have been working towards this. They were able to get from Santa Cruz to San Lorenzo Bridge which again is right across from A plus property on the back street over uh, on the other side of the river. And they came up to a, a property with a property owner that wasn't willing to allow access through their property. Uh, and there was some very, um, the, some of the people involved, such as Jeff Omquist, who actually I believe was chair of the committee at the time, um, you know, they, they tried to, to get it through there. Um, and from that particular point, they had ways to weave it in and out using the rail trails up into Boulder Creek. So it's not that it's impossible. It's the fact that we need to prioritize if we want to use what it takes to make those trails. You know, and, and there is a really bad word out there in this world, and it's called eminent domain. If something is and people feel passionate enough about it, there is a way. I'm not saying that that's the way that, that, that I look at things. I'm saying that if this community wants to get together and build it, it can be built. There are rail um, line easements. They go through people's property, but they have been there for a very long time. We need to, re to, to take a look at that. You know, the town plan, I think, is the more important part of this question. We developed and spent a lot of money on these town plans. Fred Keeley was supervisor at the time. Many of you in the audience today worked on those town plans. Those town plans talked about business development, schools, infrastructure, everything. Okay, just adjusting the gears a little bit. Counties are the most important land use authority under U.S. law. How do you envision your leadership on the Board of Supervisors in preserving a high standard of land use regulation that will sustain an environmental quality we can be proud of? I think this starts with Bruce. Well, first of all, I think we, we follow the general plan that we have here. We are not a, a fast growth county. We are a slow growth county, and that's the way we want it. People live in this region, up in the upper valley, and throughout Santa Cruz County, because that's where they want to live, and they like the protections that they have, and the sensitivity we have to environmental protection, from protection of our streams, to our forests, to the seashore. And I've been very much involved in those types of protection uh, through my legislative career and as an editor of the Santa Cruz Sentinel. Uh, when I was the first one to encourage the biggest 
Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary of the five being proposed. The, I was the first editor to suggest that in the state of California. Uh, I am now the vice chair. Fred Keeley is the chair of, of developing the or building the Marine Exploration Center. It's an education center for the Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary that we have that's going to open at the foot of the Santa Cruz Wharf come uh, July. I'm really proud of that. That is really great. I also supported those bonds that were authored by Fred Keeley when he was an assembly member and I was a senator to have uh, park bonds so we could build more park facilities including the Junction Park and Boulder Creek uh, from those bond measures. I have been out front and very protective of the environmental resources that we have because I believe that jobs and the environment can work together literally and they do and they have to because tourism and agriculture coupled with education and technology are our highest economic drivers in this county and we need to do everything we can do to protect those natural resources. And my great-grandfather in 1902 helped to establish Big Basin as the first state park in this, uh, in the first park, state park in California. I'm very proud of that and I want to keep to maintain that kind of standard. I'm really sorry about the cutbacks that are coming to the parks but I'm so proud of the Semperviron's Club, of which I'm a member, has come forth and said that they're going to support the maintenance and the maintaining and the operation of Castle, uh, Castle Rock State Park. Um, I said earlier in the introduction that I felt that I was the best candidate um, in, with the, making improvements with the planning department. I really think that you don't need to look any further. I mean, if you read the general plan, it's um, somewhat hard. To, it takes a while to read. It, uh, it's like it's written by a part economist, part tourist guide, part um, engineer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it does have a lot of really good um, things. It's probably the most difficult document to generate um, for the county, but it really dictates planning. Um, but I believe it needs to be perfected, and there's a, there's a problem with it being really confusing, and that's that some of the environmental protections get violated. And you really can't make a document like that. They recently made some amendments to it and added it, which were helpful, no doubt. But I believe that this is a document that needs to be regenerated like once every decade, and I believe, it's, I believe it needs to be re revamped again, keeping all the, the good things that are in it, but to try to make it a little bit more easy. The, the meat and potatoes really is land use. So basically, you're dividing up all the parcels that are everywhere and saying, okay, you can do this here or that, and then they get certain zoning designations. But you only have to go to Lompico and look at some of the parcels and how they were drawn up in 1930s and know that there's some real, a lot of work that needs to be continued to be done on this. But you need to have you know, my, the civil engineering work experience, I understand the, the infrastructure that was, was required, and you also need to know, you have to be educated in sciences to know the important environmental safeguards that need to be protected to, to try, bottom line, we're trying to create a pristine environment here because it's a real plus for our, our well-being and our spiritual health and also um, our tourism. It's a big, you know, we need to protect it and the planning department has a big role in that and I really believe it needs to be um, and I believe I'm the best candidate for that in that regard. Thank you. The, the question again was on land use planning. Right. right? Just, just want to make sure I get it right. Um, <coughs> land use planning and development and growth uh, and environmental protection. Um, those are the big key words here. Um, we have been fortunate in this county in the last 20 to 30 years to have a spoken and unspoken slow growth mentality. Um, and I'm actually very grateful for that. Uh, I'm fortunate when you walk out the doors of this school and you take a look at what's around you, you see the trees, you see the environment, you see rivers that for the most part are very clean. Um, and you see a, a, a lifestyle, and it's based on zoning, and it's based on development. Um, and there is a push through economic development to make a change. We are at a point 
that we will be looking at the general plan in the next four years. It is going to be rewritten and parts of it changed. And my big concern is that there's going to be a growth component to it. I want to make it really clear. I am very much into slow growth. What I want to see is I want to see these houses that were built 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s fixed up. And the ease in which they're fixed up be so that everybody in this room can walk down to the county building department and feel comfortable and feel safe that they're going to be heard and that they're going to be helped. And they're, they're going to walk out of that room knowing exactly what they need to do the first time in order to take off that lead-based paint, single wall construction, single pane windows, asbestos tile, and turn that old cabin into a jewel that is right next to the river. Because if you use good building practices today and green building practices in, 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 in your restoration of that house, you can walk away with that house being better than it ever could be. In the acquisition of the local water system in Felton, would you be supportive? And I think, I think we great. need to start with Eric. So right. Flo, you bet. I supported Flo in the first, first place. Uh, I went to some fundraisers with my kids. Um, I think they had a couple of movie shows outside at the park. You know, we were supportive that way. Uh, we also signed petitions, and as a family, we're very supportive of it. Um, we're looking at that again right now. Um, you, you, you've, water issues are going to be at the top of the list for years to come, water wars. Um, we're taking a look right now, or seeing in front of us, the Lompico Water District having issues. And it, it, it's made the, the press a little bit. You're, you're, you're seeing residents reaching out for support. You're seeing um, a mixture of, of for and against a merger. The Lompico Water District is going to be an issue in the next couple of years with its infrastructure, no matter what happens. You know, it, it's got about $2.3 million worth of upgrades that need to be done by some sources. You know, Bill's an expert, he sits on it. But from my understanding is the residents are reaching out to SLV Water District to try and do an acquisition or a merger. And SLV Water District is also being very safe in, in how they approach that. They want to make sure there's a consensus of the people who live in that community. So we're going through this right now, and I think we're going to continue to go through this. There's a lot of little municipalities out there, special water districts. We're going to have to work together as a community and as a county to solve our water problems. You know, I, I am in favor of the, the north-south tie that they're putting in for, for or looking at. The terminology might not be perfect, but it, it, it's to give Ziani, I mean, Lompico, the water that they need in case of a drought. It's an emergency connection. That needs to happen. You know, we don't want to be in a, in a fire danger. We don't want to run out of water when, when we have, you know, drought situations or overdrafting of, of the river. We need to really look at that now. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, well, I support the merger with the Lompico Water District. Uh, it was really kind of a bad planning decision for Lompico Water because there were only 500 houses and we couldn't, it's also a complicated water system. It has, we have our own treatment plants and we have a lot of elevation changes. Sometimes there's a small water district that just meters off, you know, the larger water district so they don't have a lot of costs. Lompico doesn't, they have a, they're a full service water district so we couldn't support our overhead so merging makes sense. And yes, we are, we let, uh, I wasn't on the board, I'm getting blamed for it, but our infrastructure deteriorated and we need about 2.6 million dollars was the last estimate and um, turn it and we want to merge with San Lorenzo Valley totally support that and it will be a plus for San Lorenzo Valley Water District adding 500 customers is not to sneeze at and they'll also get a part of part of the water system that will be have all new equipment etc so um, I've been told when they did take over the Felton Water that they did have some issues um, lots of things that they didn't foresee that they needed to fix up 
Um, some people, um, but they, you know, the German company, Cal, Cal American Water, they just wanted them out of there, and so I believe that was a plus. It really helps to have one big water district because they, they, you know, they can co consolidate and they can they can cover all their overhead costs, and then they can they can really respond and serve their customers very well. So. Um, I know that you started out talking about Felton water, but I believe that this is more concerned with Lompico water. So, but any of you out there can help get this merger helped. I, you know, I really, um, you know, want to support that, and it really makes sense. We just, uh, anyway, thank you. Yeah. Yes, it, uh, yes, I, I would be uh, very pleased to try to accommodate this, which would have to be a, an agreement between two independent water districts, Lompico and San Lorenzo uh, Water. And San Lorenzo Water District is a very well run, uh, and it has pristine water quality, uh, and it should be, you should be pleased with the, the services you're getting from your water board, because it's really top notch. Uh, this is going to be something, though, that the, uh, from what I've heard and talked with some of the San Lorenzo Valley Water uh, directors, that they're, they're very concerned that they don't let, left holding the bag is what happened in the, the previous water uh, merger, so to speak. So we, we have to, they'll be very sensitive to that. Uh, Mr. Smallman knows much more about the water district uh, than I do, sitting on, having sat or sitting on the water board, but it is, uh, it is a very brittle system at this point and it needs some attention. And I think that the San Lorenzo Valley Water Board, uh, when I've talked to the members, they have seemed willing and able to, to be able to do that. It's just a matter of making sure that they're not left holding the bag. They want to help their neighbor, and I think it's, it would be a very good, uh, uh, very, very good result if these two uh, districts could merge. Continuing with water, what is the first step we need to take to be sure of an adequate supply into the future? And I'm going to start with Bruce. Well, we have limited uh, we have limited options because we don't we don't have any surface water to go to. And so that's very, very, very much of a concern. But we do have a lot of, uh, we have a great aquifer here. I, as I mentioned before, we have some of the most pristine water uh, resource in, in this county and anywhere you want to look. But we, we really have to see how we can work together and have tie-ins like we do with, with Lompico. Uh, I hope it gets done with Lompico. That can be done. Uh, the, the water district is very sensitive to this. Uh, the first thing that everybody looks to is conservation. Well, that's easily said, and to the credit of people of Santa Cruz County, this county has probably the best record of conservation of any county in the state. And we might have to be asked to do more. And if it's uh, maybe not to the, the reduction that we had before, but if it's another 5%, that will go a long way for us to, uh, for us to accommodate our needs that we, we're going to have in the future. Also, to tie in with one another is a very good, I think, option that we should, we should look into because there's some aquifers that might dry up or get, get more shallow than others at times, and then we, we need to have that source, as well as the, the reservoir for the city of Santa Cruz that it depends on. So it's going to take a conservation effort and I think a cooperative effort between the districts and the cities of Scotts Valley and Santa Cruz to make this work in the long run, because it's our most precious resource and our most, most basic resource that we need to protect. I think conservation is the very first thing we need to take a look at. And then I think after conservation, we need to take a look at our building practices. I disagree with the fact that, that we can't do more. We can do a lot more. But in order to do more, you've got to think outside the box and you've got to make sacrifices. Building practices today, you're changing out gross pollutant toilets, shower heads, faucets. You know, some places you're taking a look at doing a rainwater catchment system. Those are alternatives. We need to make those priorities. If we put rainwater catchment systems in all buildings and all 
commercial building applications, if we take a look at retention and detention systems to slow down the surface water to replenish the aquifers, it can be done. If we take a look at pavement and it's pervious that allows for the water to soak down, it's possible. They're implementing that today in new building. If we want to talk about conservation, we're going to have to take a look at going backwards. We may have to take a look at ripping up parking lots that are existing, putting in new systems, repaving it with, imper with pervious pavement. We need this water problem goes a lot farther than just Scotts Valley and San Lorenzo Valley and Santa Cruz. We're talking SoCal Creek water. We're talking Pajaro Valley. We're talking saltwater in, in, infusion into the aquifers. We're talking about an aquifer in Scotts Valley that has not come up ever. They flatlined it. We need to take a look at recharging the aquifers and thinking outside the box. They're expensive alternatives. I've met with every city managed water manager, SoCal, Santa Cruz, Scotts Valley, San Lorenzo Valley. They're working together. But the thing they've all said, there's no more low hanging fruit. They're all expensive alternatives. We need to look at those expensive alternatives and prioritize them. Thank you. Yeah, I get, I, I'm, I'm really interested in water conservation um, issues. I, I worked actually on the first step system in California, it was in Penn Valley, but that's just a secondary uh, septic tank effluent pump instead of having leach fields. It goes, the water goes to a treatment plant and then it, they generate reclaimed water and use it for irrigation. I, you know, I think that might work in some areas in the valley. And I'm also interested in these personal home um, septic tank treatment plants. I think it would be really cool to have a septic tank. Um, you have to have an additional tanks to aerate it, and then you, it has to go to another tank that kills all the microorganisms. So then, then you can use the water for plants and stuff, and everybody could do that. So you're killing two birds and two stone. You're not getting all the bad nutrients going in the San Lorenzo uh, River, and you're also saving a lot of water. Um, it's going to be expensive, but you're actually taking care of um, your your sewer. So that's some of the responsibility of the county to take care of. You know, they build sanitation districts and stuff like that, and you could actually have some of this at home. But really, the county is really doing a bad job with water pollution, and we need to we need to address that, and we can address both water conservation and water pollution at the same time doing that. Is it a big, huge, you know, top priority? Yeah, it is, and, and I, but I like to work towards doing that. And I, I believe I'm the only candidate that really has experience in that field um, to address that. And, um, and then lastly, I, I like to revisit, I remember when I first moved here, the uh, sand courier operator talked about building a reservoir at no cost up there, um, and you, so many people might know, but I would like to revisit that, but he, he wanted to extend his mining permit to build a reservoir up on the sand quarry. Um, so it would cost nothing, and it might be really a uh, nice, good place to store water, water storage, recharge the water storage. Uh, it also may be a real um, place to, for tourists to go to, or for recreation as well. Thanks. Okay, now we're going to shift to some more, less frequent topics, but a big one. Brookdale Lodge. As a Brookdale resident, I am concerned about what the candidates are going to do to improve the Brookdale Lodge. <laughs> and I think we need to start with Bill on this. Well, I wanted to talk about the Brookdale Lodge in my con conclusion because I really believe that my Board of Economic Development would have helped in that area. If Mr. I can't remember his name, Kakar, Kakar I believe it is, if he, before he even purchased the property, if he went to the Board of, the board of Economic Development, um, they would have immediately said, hey, you have no experience uh, remodeling uh, hotels. You need to hire this guy, a construction manager, and you're, these permits are going to be involved. Describe all the permits, the costs, etc. Then he would have known exactly what costs, who he need to hire to get the job done right, and it was a complete disaster. We can blame this guy all we want, but um, you know who knows. 
But the thing is, is that also this board, and I want to say it, um, even though it would have informed Mr. Kakar of how he could have successfully rebuild the Brookdale Lodge, the, um, if the county wasn't really being a, a, a you know, serving him well and giving him, def I don't know, I'm not, uh, I'm not making any accusations, but they could have had some difficulty um, getting his permits. They could have corrected that too as well. That's why I'm really excited about creating a board like this. What to do now? I believe, he, well, he's in court, and I believe that he either needs to be forced to sell or he needs to, be, uh, uh, to sell the Brookdale Lodge, or he needs to be uh, some restrictions, and he, then he needs he, he needs to, um, some time limits. And if he if he has the fund, he may not have the funds to do so. But to get on a schedule, it's a lot. It's a big loss for our tourists. And the Brookdale Lodge is great. I miss it. And I want it back. So he either I believe he I don't know. If, I'm not a lawyer, but I believe that he either needs to be forced to sell or get on a schedule of rebuilding and get it back online because. We're starting to lose the name recognition as well, and you start to lose ter people from out of town too. They, oh, I don't even know what that place, and not you know, you, you lose your name recognition. So I, I, you know, I think we need it's an important thing to fix. Thanks. Boy, this it's a complicated situation because you're dealing with private property rights, uh, lawsuits, uh, all kinds of things, and I think that the the county needs to really get energized and enforce some of the issue to the greatest extent it can through its uh, building and zoning procedures, which uh, need improvement on their own uh, to allow you to come into the planning department and know what you have to pay and, and get a good idea of how long it's going to take to get a permit. That's probably complicated a little on the county level. Listen, there's not one of us here that doesn't want to see that thing built. That is a critical element to the tourism trade of the San Lorenzo Valley. And when it's up and running and doing well, we all do better. And um, I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I, have, uh, I think that we can press some issues there on the county to make force him into action or out of there one way or the other. Um, <laughs> It's, it's, a, it's a complicated situation, as I said, but it's something that we really need as a county to address and, uh, and really have better oversight and see something like this coming and why did it um, happen. It, this, <clears throat> he wasn't um, you know, a good manager, shall we say. I mean, it, the court system is showing us that right now. So that's something that the county probably didn't have any control over, but we can have control over trying to have this come back and then maybe seeing who builds it in the long run as well. Brookdale Lodge. The Brookdale Lodge is a jewel. And walking districts, I've had so many people come up with so many different ideas about what we can do with the Brookdale Lodge. One of, the, one of the ones that stuck out to me, which was very different, was low-cost senior housing. Turn it in and do a mixed use on it. It's different, but the cool thing is it's someone out in the community that approached me with an idea. I like that. That's how I want to lead. The Brookdale Lodge, to me, however, is a place where my 103-year-old aunt, before she died, told me the stories of coming down from Alameda to our cabin and stopping at the Brookdale Lodge and having those boys deliver groceries up to the cabin uh, on the weekends. That was a highlight of her summer. I mean, I want people to be able to tell stories like that. So this is how you fix something like that, or how I feel you fix something like that. The county needs to be proactive. As a supervisor, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to talk to those lawyers. And I'm going to talk to people and find out how we can make it happen. It, my degree is in resort management, recreation, and, and, and tourism. You know, I want to, I know exactly the impact that that resort has. I want to see it up and running, and it's going to take some big steps, you know, and there are people that are more experienced than I am that I'm going to look to to help make that happen. And the first thing you do is you start a conversation and a dialogue with the owner there and with a, with, with a real estate attorney and with county council, and you go to county council and say, this is what we want. How do we make it happen? And then we have to take a look at it from an economic development standpoint and put together a team that's going to attract a buyer that can come in, 
reshape it and put it back out onto the market so that we as a business community and, and a tourist community can, can utilize it. It's a gem. We want to see it fixed back up. Thanks. In your opinion, how can the county best ensure an adequate supply of affordable child care? Uh, affordable child care. We, we can't uh, really depend on ourselves to make this happen. Uh, as a county, we are agents of the state and have to implement the laws of the state and we're their right arm person to do that. Um, it is very, very uh, critical that we work through the state to see that they give adequate funding for this kind of services, these kind of services. And this is one of the places where I think I could really become a very, very strong spokesperson for this county and for the counties throughout the state. To, uh, that the state is, is shoving more responsibilities down uh, and onto the counties. I think this is the time for us to demand that they put up their fair share. This, is, this has been, uh, the state has been cutting back this source of funding for uh, several years running. Well, they've had to in, in very, uh, a great uh, number of areas. But this is one where they've had it even cut back in a higher percentage than is what's necessary, in my opinion. We have to get together as counties and let our elected representatives in the state. Sure, I want to do it myself, but the fact of the matter is much of that funding comes from the state sources and federalists for that matter. So I think that with my experience and the contacts that I have, I'll be able to help us talk to the right people at the right time to get our fair share. Uh, I think there has been enough cutbacks in this, this area because we have just work, working families, literally now, that need more of this type of care. And we ought to see that we are able to provide it. And we're gonna need the help of the, uh, the other levels of governments to help us do it. I like to be one that takes care of it myself, but the, the state, or the county itself, is not in a position to fund that. We're gonna have to get the lion's share of that through other uh, levels of government. Okay. Um, to be honest, I haven't given a lot of thought about uh, child care on, on this issue, but um, but it goes on kind of on the, in the line with uh, you know I gave a lot of thought with uh, home in care nursings because um, they only get paid eleven dollars and fifty an hour, but they do you know I'm all in favor of uh, keeping as much state funding as possible you know as we can get to fund. Um, these programs, but I'm also sort of interested in including um, paying customers to share the burden for possibly both this child care and in-home health care uh, to hire more people and actually advertise and have a county agency that provide these services um, so we could collect more funding to support them from people that could afford to pay and then also maintain um, government um, funding. And, um, not, and I think we can pay these people a lot more to, to, for the service and we can really provide quality service that way. It's just, uh, I'm just brainstorming a thought. I think it's a way to really maintain a, a good quality um, service. And, and there's really a lot of demand for this service for people that don't have money and then there's also people that have money that can afford to pay it um, out there for that. And I think it might possibly work. Thank you. I know child care is a huge issue for working families, um, and it's not one that can be answered easily. Um, I don't think we can depend upon the state, though. I mean, we, we keep hearing that the state's broken, it's not going to work, and it hasn't worked. Um, and I think that, that we've got some, some good local leaders that have been pushing those buttons already, and we're not, we're not getting heard. I think that we have to look locally and we have to look amongst our own communities to support our communities. Exactly what that looks like, I don't have the answer to that. But I think that if we take a look at some of the outside agencies that are there now that specialize in outreach for families and for kids, we take a look at Mountain Community Resource Center, we take a look at Community Bridges, 
the, the family resource centers, there's six of them in the county. Um, there's county-based programming through counseling centers. We need to put together a group of people, a collaborative, and find a way to create affordable childcare. Um, because we can't stop people from working, they need to work. And when, people, when the second income is going directly for childcare, you're not making any progress. And, and you hear about that problem all the time. So do I have an answer for that? I don't. But would I reach out to some people and find a way to get an answer? Yes. And make some phone calls to the state? You bet. We've got some good representatives at the state level that I can reach out to and would reach out to. But I, I can't guarantee or even suggest that they would come through because they haven't so far. Thanks. This should be a fairly short one, unless you choose to expand it. Do you favor spending county money in support of nonprofits like Planned Parenthood? Oh. Eric? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, regardless of state or federal laws, marijuana cultivation has become a big business. Do, how do we ensure safe and environmentally sensitive practices? <laughs> Bill? Well, my concern here is, uh, like, you know, I'm, I'm a big open space advocate. I support uh, the Central Environments Group and its land trust as well. And, um, you know, there's a lot of renegade guides uh, that go into these open space areas and have renegade um, pot farms. And um, I think it's a big problem, really. I, you know, especially when I, I actually wrote uh, John Laird about it because when, when they decided to close the state parks, I believe that this would be a big issue and I thought, you know, it's a good thing, you know, that, that you know, there's a lot of damage would occur to the state parks with this problem. Um, litter and everything else that goes along with it. Um, as far as, the, you know, the legal cultivation areas, you know, um, that's, you know, there's, there's a big problem, obviously, that, you know, the federal government, it's illegal, state government, they're trying to make it legal, et cetera, et cetera. You know, these guys need to get their act together and figure out if they want marijuana legal or not. That way it can stay, uh, cultivation can stay in places where it's not environmentally damaging. So, but, um, you know, uh, that's why um, when they did close the state parks, I did want, I said, hey, why don't you just uh, sell passes to those, us people that are really concerned about the state parks so we can go out there and if we see some illegal activity of, of growing pot farms that we could simply call on our cell phone and call a ranger to take care of that so that doesn't happen. So, but I, you know, I think, it, you know, there's a lot of really remote places where that can happen and, and that's a concern of mine. Thank you. Yeah, when I, when I was in the state legislature, I, I did support the use of uh, marijuana for medicinal purposes when it was overseen properly. Uh, it doesn't seem to have a problem there, but the problem that we have with marijuana, long and short of it is, is there's different levels of the government that enforce it different ways. And until they get their act together and how we're supposed to do it, the governments, the levels of governments themselves are going to be working against each other. Uh, we can see uh, what we, we want here. We can try to plan and say this is what you should do. But if it's not legal in the eyes of the state or primarily the, the federal government, we, we just uh, open ourselves up to some big problems and some big lawsuits. We have to be very careful with that. I do think that there is a use for marijuana, that, we should, uh, that it should be for, uh, open for medicinal uses. But uh, to how to make that work for all levels of law enforcement to agree upon, we haven't reached that point yet. And we need to do that, uh, and it's going to. St I think it's going to have to start from the top on down. 
I think that, as I said, there should be uh, available uses in some situations, but uh, until we get uh, the, the, uh, the okay from the other levels of government, it's going to really complicate the situation. And what we don't want to be doing is defending as a county and spending thousands and thousands of dollars defending something that we're going to lose on and something that we might even want to happen. So we have to be very careful with that. Thank you. Could you repeat the question again, please? Regardless of state and federal laws, marijuana cultivation has become a big business. How do we ensure safe and environmentally sensitive practices? Okay, the question isn't about the legalization of medical marijuana. It's about environmental and safety issues. So let's talk a little bit about that to start with. Uh, there was actually an article in the paper a week back about you know code enforcement going out and taking a look at some of these quote, legal fields, and imposing the same style of rules and regulations that go on to anybody that does any type of building practices. You have to have erosion control measures. You have to have wattles and drainage, and make sure that there aren't any environmental uh, grading or unnecessary grading. You know, we have the, what that I believe is more of the question around safety and environmental safety. It's not whether or not we can legalize it or not. That's another question. You know, the voters of the state of California, you know, voted to legalize medical marijuana. It, and whether we want to turn our heads or not, it is a huge part of this community. There, it's undoubtedly a huge economic impact to our district and our county. We need to take a look at that. Um, we, or as a supervisor, we have to also uphold the law of the feds. So that's different. But I do think that we can go out there and impose environmental protections. They, you know, if you're going to do a legalized uh, farm, you have to get a grading permit if you're moving around dirt. You have to have that inspection. You know, they're not, code enforcement officers are going out, taking a look at this, environmental planning is going out and taking a look at some of these farms. They're not turning them in to the feds. They're not trying to, to be the police in this. They're just trying to protect the environment. We need to give them the resources to be able to go out and do that. Thanks. Okay, this one's a concentrate question. So, focus in. <laughs> Which of the following best expresses your vision uh, for the role of county government? One, it should first seek to encourage and facilitate the service efforts of individuals, voluntary associations, and lower levels of government. Two, it should first seek to provide programs and facilities which serve the public. You better pass the card down. <laughs> okay, um, this question needs to start with Eric. Thank you. I think I see number three here, all the above. Um, um, Seek to encourage and facilitate the service efforts of the volunteer association and lower levels of government. You know, I, I think number one to start with, but you know what? You also need number two to be an effective government. Thanks. That's very diplomatic. <laughs> um, it should. This one is sorry, it's it really is it's just a tough one. Um, yeah, I, I have to agree with Eric. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a twofer also. You know, so it's a, yeah, I just don't know how you can say one over the other. Well, sometimes, sometimes we have to do the hard ones. 
What do you think is the most pressing issue for youth in the Valley? And what have you done and will you do about it? Let's see, Bill will start. We'll start with Bill. Okay, well, uh, well I, yeah, definitely my first priority, I guess, I guess uh, you know, I've stated earlier, I want to create a board of economic development. And I think that's a uh, top priority. Second one is, uh, um, you know, this uh, road maintenance program to get that moving along that um, John Presley has recommended. And um, there's some other, uh, other safety infrastructure improvement projects that are all there that are smaller that are also a big priority too, um, basically for safety and good access. This bike path from the school, I think that, that that's a big priority, and um, and you know resolving the Lompico water um, merger is a priority for me, obviously, but I think it'll be good for the entire community as well. And then extending on beyond that, um, and, you know, we need to, like I said, with the economic board development to um, maintain and increase our tourism industry here in our, uh, in the, in, in our district would be very helpful, generate resources um, to do more things. And um, other than that, um, like I said, um, the, the wa water, like before, uh, the water conservation methods that we need to start implementing. Some of these um, improvement projects, like I said, they're not top priority, but they're, they would be really, we need to stay focused on even this long bike path. I mean, I, I don't mind. It's like, you know, I would like high speed rail. I mean, but we, we need to stay, okay, the, you know, keep, keep on focus on what we need to do to get it done. Um, but that doesn't mean we have to expend the resources and take it away from the high priority items that we need right now. Thank you. I think the, uh, the top priority of, of us is to provide adequate public safety and law enforcement for the citizens of this district of this county. If you don't feel safe in your home and your neighborhoods, you just don't feel it's not good anywhere. That is a basic component that we should provide as your representative on the County Board of Supervisors. There's no question that there the, the road system when I've been going door to door, that is a huge thing that, that has an impact on that law enforcement system and the outstanding volunteer fire departments that we have in this district. Uh, th th those are really critical things that we need in the economy. We, we should have in the county a one portal where somebody can come in and say, what do I have to do to get my building permit, to start my business, and let me know in 24 hours or less, or two years or less, it's, it's taken for somebody, for crime any sakes. It's, we just have to be more accommodating to people and welcome them into our community. If they come here to have a business, to create jobs for the people in our district and this county. Uh, but those are the, the real, the, the major things that we have to do and, and covered with all of those is the protection of our natural resources because that's the, the gem that we all appreciate and that's why we want to live here in the first place. Wasn't the question about teens? Yes. About youth. <clears throat> youth, I thought, I thought so. I just wanted to make sure because that's not what I heard. <laughs> Let's yeah. talk about the youth for a minute then, why don't we? Um, top priority of youth, correct? What do you think? For you. Oh, what do you think? Okay, good, that helps. Thank you, that's why I asked. For me, the top priority, there's many of them. Um, not to repeat, I also believe that we really need to take a look at having better law enforcement and fire protection in the rural areas of the San Lorenzo Valley. I talked about it before with the fact that I think that we need to bring more of a presence here into our community. We're about to build a $44 million police station, sheriff station, down in Santa Cruz Live Oak area. You know, it would have been nice to have had some of that money, even though I know it was RDA money, but I thought of how can we build a small substation up in the San Lorenzo Valley so that we weren't sharing a station with CAL FIRE. I know that we have to look at that, 
but how could we have done that? So that's a priority. Fire, Los Cumbres, the outer areas of, of CSA 48 are having a very difficult time funding their stations. You know, and they're looking to mutual aid from the volunteer fire departments in the valley to help protect their area. We need to find the funding. They need $1.2 million to adequately fund their stations to upgrade, upgrade their equipment. We need to look at that. It's not a ton of money. It's out there. In fact, that amount of money has been diverted um, through AB 127 into another area that they could get that money. Uh, I think tourism and increasing tourism uh, is a huge um, avenue that we need to take a look at. I've been working through Boulder Creek Parks and Rec, through the Business Association, through the Chamber, through Felton Chamber, to take a look at a plan, a strategic plan, on how to increase tourism through, his, through marketing, through a historic, scenic uh, corridor, and joining partnerships with Scotts Valley and Santa Cruz in putting together a master plan, marketing plan, to increase that. We live in a gateway to scenic beauty. You know, let, let's work together to make that happen. And I'm already working with people within this community to make that happen. It starts right here locally to, to improve it. Thank you. OK, I want to do one quickie on the County Women's Commission report shows that women in Santa Cruz County are underpaid, underinsured, and underrepresented especially on the Board of Supervisors. <laughs> How will you change this reality? I think the first thing I would do is, is support the Women's Commission. The Women's Commission has been working hard for years uh, on the CEDAW um, document and trying to get our county to uphold its basic principles. Our government is one of the few that is yet to adopt it. This was a policy that has been adopted worldwide except for smaller countries and the United States. We need to take a look at that. In fact, I was flabbergasted when I was at the Board of Supervisors meeting about six weeks ago when the Women's Commission did a presentation to the Board of Supervisors about implementing a plan to collect data on women in the workforce, equal, equal pay, equal representation, equal people on the bodies, and it did not pass unanimously. It's unbelievable that that didn't happen. How we bring more leaders, in the report that I was reading, it said that 37% of the elected officials, I believe it was 37 to 39, don't totally quote me, are women. And, and that's a low percentage. I mean, we need to empower people within the community, and we need to give, we need to work together to be able to motivate the women leaders out there and have them feel safe to come out and, and, and be role models. I mean, most of the people that I surround myself with, they are the sharpest women I've ever known, you know, and I would love to see a strong woman running for supervisor. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I definitely would encourage, I hope, you know, obviously there's not going to be a woman on that after this election on the uh, board, but I hopefully encourage next election that uh, a woman would run uh, for one of the open spots. But, um, you know, I'm all equal opportunity uh, person. Um, women are clearly make better managers than men. Um, <laughs> it's just, they, they, they really do. Um, um, and so, um, you know, uh, you know, obviously, you know, if there's some um, discrimination there um, or, you know, we need to encourage more women into the workforce because they really do make um, quality managers and, and I, I would like to support that uh, more in the um, county government. Um, if, you know, I don't, we're, we don't want to go backwards <laughs> and make it a male-dominated uh, um, uh, you know, county um, government or you know, civilization. 
So we need to move forward. Same thing with, you know, we, we went, went to a foreman with the LGBT thing. There's, a, there's still, you know, even though we're in groovy Santa Cruz, there's a lot of discrimination and hate and stuff like that that we need to stay focused to stamp all that stuff out and just move forward and we're all equal. Um, so we need to move forward in that. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, we, we sure we sure are equal, or we should be, and there's no reason that a, a woman should not get equal pay for an equal job that uh, is out there. And there are leaders, and it's good to see there's some CEOs throughout the world and so forth that are women, but uh, there's not enough of them in the United States. But uh, I think one thing that is for sure, we better start listening, because I think there's more women than men in this county, and I think there are in the nation, so we better listen up, men. Uh, because uh, you know they they are good managers, and if you don't believe it, just come to my house and ask for Mary McPherson. <laughs> okay, is your seat getting really hard? Yes. Okay, as you can see, I still have another two hours of questions here. So you've been very prolific, but I think that we need to bring this to a close. And one of the things that I thought we could do that with is, what is your major point of difference from the other two candidates? Wow. We're going to start with Bruce. We're going to come with Eric and then with Bill. I think um, I have a proven track record of, having, uh, of getting things done. I have the experience that none of the other two do. And you know, I think that anybody who runs for public out of office ought to be applauded. You know, we all want to run for public service and to serve you in the best abilities we have. But there are some qualities that each of us have, that each and every one of us has over here that are better than the person sitting next to you. But mine, I think, are experience, knowledge and the personal contacts that I can have throughout government to bring more things to Santa Cruz County and the, and the fifth district in particular. And this is particularly important in this time of what we call realignment that began in October 1st when the state started shifting more responsibilities to counties and I like the idea of shifting more to local government that we would uh, incarcerate in our jails first time felon, nonviolent felons in our own prison systems. This has been going well in Santa Cruz and our Sheriff Wolwack, who has endorsed me as a matter of fact, so I guess I might say something good about him. But in fact, he is really doing a model job for the rest of the state. Health and Human Services is going to come next and there's going to be more and more coming our way. Clearly, I believe I have the best in the experience, in the knowledge, in the personal context to see how this can get done. And I would love to have that opportunity to serve you in the June 5th election, and that's why I'm asking you to vote for me in the June 5th election, to be your county supervisor for the 5th district. Because I think I can do the best job for you in this time of realignment, this time of change, unlike we have seen since Proposition 13 shifted so much of the responsibility up to the state well, it's coming back to us, and I'm ready for it, and I would love to serve you and implement it for us in the 5th District and all of Santa Cruz County. Thank you. I think I'll talk more about where my strengths are. My strength, one of my biggest strengths, is my local knowledge of what works right here, right now. Uh, and the connections and the ability to collaborate with everybody in this community. I have working with Boulder Creek Parks and Rec, working with Mountain Community Resource Center, building the Teen Center. I've been able to form collaborations and partnerships with this community. We are looking at needing to make a change and that change is going to happen locally. I have the connection locally to make those changes. You've seen it with the partnerships that I've been able to make with Boulder Creek Business Association, Felton Business Association, working with the Chamber, creating a vision and being able to implement that vision from a very local 
perspective. I am a visionary. I am a multitasking project manager. I work with people all the time. Today, I'm running seven jobs. I'm coaching a baseball team. I find time to spend with my kids and my, my wife a little bit. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm running for county supervisor and I am bringing myself up to speed because I do not have this level of experience but I do have the level of experience that everybody in this room is used to having and seeking out. And I will look to everybody in this room to help me govern this fifth district because that's how we're gonna get it done. And that's the skill set that I have. The other skill set that I have is I can listen, I'm approachable, and I will always follow through on what I say I'm gonna do. Thank you. Yeah, when I first uh, said the introduction, um, I, you know, I really felt that the wrong candidates were, were getting elected. And I really felt that I really wanted to go on my message. I want to specifically say what I would do if I got elected supervisor, not give you a broad, bunch of broad generalizations of issues that we're all obviously in favor of. It's really not quite as complicated as it all sounds and, you know, um, like I said, I want, I want to create a board of economic development. Jobs is, to me, is the answer of taking care of the realignment plan. It's the only realistic, helpful thing to deal with that situation. None of us really has any law enforcement experience. Um, and I also want to again say that I have the experience that can really address the planning department, the Environmental Health Services Department, and also I'm clearly the best candidate to prioritize infrastructure improvement projects. These are all very main things with the county that need to be done. I don't want to make it confusing. I want to make it very clear and specific on what I would, exactly what I would do. I don't want to come up and stay a lot of field gold, but that's what separates me from these two guys. I'm, I'm dealing with specifics. I'm telling you what exactly what I'm going to do. I'm not going to go over these and gloss and, and give you a bunch of lip service and tell you I'm not here to serve. I'm here to work and work hard and do these things that I'm telling you that I'm going to do and I believe it's going to make a big difference and help make the county a lot better and also remove the uncer uncertainty of destroying the environment here and keep maintaining it. Thank you. Okay, on the schedule was for each of them to give a two-minute closing statement. So we'll start with Eric, then Bruce, then Bill. Sure. All right, I'd like to thank everybody tonight for coming. Um, it would be my pleasure to serve you. Um, I'd also like to thank the Valley Women's Club for sponsoring the event tonight and the League of Women Voters. Um, what it's going to take for me to win this election is going to take your support. It's going to take going out and talking with people and spreading the word of what you heard here tonight. I have a web page. Please take a look at it. I have a Facebook page. You know, reach out. I've got a bunch of YouTube videos that are out there. And I do also believe that endorsements are important. I have been endorsed by the Democratic Women's Club of Santa Cruz. I have been endorsed by Santa Cruz Democratic Central Committee, by People Power, by SEIU, by Monterey Bay Central Labor Council, by OE3 Operating Engineers, the Pajaro Valley Cesar Chavez Democratic Club, the Monterey Santa Cruz County's Building and Construction Trade Councils, just to mention a few. Thank you again. I look forward to your vote, getting your vote. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I've had the distinct pleasure of serving you previously in the state legislature and in every one of those uh, races for the assembly and the Senate I, I won in the fifth district. And I appreciate you giving me that opportunity to serve you as I, I was very fortunate. I feel like I was a very fortunate person to be able to serve you in that capacity. Again, I think that I can bring to the table someone that's not going to go through a learning experience and doing something at this level of government because it's different and it's important 
that we get things on the table and people know what our needs are. And not only have I received all of the endorsements from the sheriffs, the past immediate sheriffs, the fire, the immediate fire uh, district uh, supporters of like Steve Sanders, uh, Sam Robostelli, uh, Mr. Boynton, uh, those people have supported me because they have seen how I have delivered from them in that capacity. And I was known as the most independent vote in the legislature. And I'm going to listen to you and I'm going to work with you. And I'm going to be here all the time to serve you as I can best do as a county supervisor. This is a thrilling opportunity for me. And I've had people say, well, why did you, you know, go from the state to the county? This is coming home and I can have a more direct impact. And again, to get back to it, in this period of realignment, it is very, very important we know who to go to, how to get there, and get things done. And I think I can do that better than any of the three candidates here. I respect their opinions and what they have accomplished and what they have done in the past, but I really appreciate the support system that I have, not only from the law enforcement community, but from environmental leaders throughout this county and throughout this state. It is something that I really uh, am proud of and I appreciate and I would love to have the opportunity to serve you as your county supervisor come June 5th, and I ask for your vote. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, thanks everybody for having me uh, talk here. And um, yeah, I, I don't, I, as everybody knows, I'm pretty much the underdog. I, I, I wasn't working on uh, endorsements, um, you know, I work over the hill. I'm really. I really believe I'm the only candidate that's coming out of the hard knocks of the private sector. You know, I've been working over the hill, uh, commuting, uh, well, actually the past 23 years all over California, but the past 15 I commute to San Jose. And I've never really had job security. You know, being a construction estimator is tough. You, you know, you have to be very competitive and, um, and do that. So, um, but, I, you know, again, I'm really just running on message. I'm really trying to convey exactly what I would do um, as your elected supervisor. And, um, and I'm not going on endorsements. I'm going on message. And I really, like I said before, if you really want change, change the way you vote. You are the boss. When you when listen to somebody else say, hey, this guy, I want to I wanna vote for him, you're taking his judgment. You're not using your, your judgment. You want to use your judgment, and I believe, I really believe that that is the reason why, you know, the one, the right people aren't running, and one, second, the right people aren't really getting elected. You want people that are out of the private sector, out of the hard knocks of private sector, that are realists, that can really do to make uh, real changes. How are you going to know what these guys are going to do? They really just gave you a bunch of generalizations about stuff. Think about it. I really gave some specific ideas of what I would do, and that's create a board of economic development and make improvements with the planning department, and make improvements with the environmental health service department, and I'm the best candidate for infrastructure improvement projects, which we really need. We need somebody up there to make those things happen. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to thank my helpers for tonight. First, fellow league member Barbara Lewis, who was the timer. The students from the government class, thank you very much. I think it's particularly important that they chose to take some time to observe how civic life works, and I appreciate them. You have been a wonderful audience with tons of questions, and I want to thank the candidates for presenting their point of view. Thank you.
Don't you think Anne did a brilliant job? Yeah.